So it's so good to be back with you in the nave and to be with you in the virtual space. It's been a, it's been a minute. Um, I spend a lot of time, church, looking for and creating places where our individual bodies and our collective bodies can harmonize, can settle, can find some space and grace and breath. I believe this is one of the most important reasons that we gather. Harmony, settling, space, grace, and breath. So this morning, if you're open to that as a possibility for yourself, I'm going to ask you to do some things that you may not normally do in church. So just go with it. So turn around and look behind you over one shoulder. And just feel that lovely stretch in your body. And then come back and turn and look over your other shoulder. Oh, some of y'all didn't stretch this morning. I can hear the bones cracking. <laughs> and come back and look up. This is such a beautiful space. And then look down and just let your neck muscles release. Now look to the right and look to your left. And take whichever ear you want and tilt it towards the shoulder. And then do the opposite ear and shoulder. And then finally, this will be great for the little ones, wiggle, massage, whatever part of your body needs a little extra attention. Oh, as we are living in anxious times, and so what we're doing is creating a little room in our bodies, in our minds actually, and in our spirits for what we are about to receive. So I invite you to come back to this movement as we enter the sermon this morning, because it's gonna be a little heavy, but God's got us, amen? Amen. Let's pray. Creator and creating God, in whom we move and live and have our being, we thank you for the thrill of new beginnings for the electricity that sizzles even now as we start a new season together, together at the Riverside Church. We know that with beginnings, there are endings. So be with us on the way as we honor the past, grieve our losses, and walk together to your promised land. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before you can begin something new, you have to end what used to be. Before you can learn a new way of doing things, you have to unlearn the old way. Before you be can become a different kind of person, you must let go of your old identity. Beginnings depend on endings. The problem is, we don't like endings. Take a deep breath, church. These are the words of Dr. William Bridges, considered one of the preeminent authorities on change. And I've been thinking a lot about change since we were last together. I moved a few weeks ago into a beautiful new home and I'm very unsettled there. I had to keep the lights on the first night because I didn't know my way around in the dark. Moving is a big change. It does not have the familiarity, this apartment, of the home I lived in for six years. I've lost home. At the same time, I couldn't stay where I was. It was time to move on. So like the Hebrew people fleeing Pharaoh this morning, there comes a time when we all must leave home, 
leave the familiar. And always, always, we leave home with mixed feelings. I don't care how ready we are for change, how exciting the new beginning is, how much milk and honey we've been guaranteed in the promised land. We don't like endings. The people Moses is leading, they don't like endings either. It didn't matter that they were enslaved. It didn't matter that they were the property of another human. It seemingly didn't matter that the Pharaoh had decreed way back when Moses was born that all Hebrew boys age two and under should be thrown in the river and drowned. None of that seemed to matter. They did not want life as they knew it to change. And they let Moses know, we would rather be enslaved than embrace the end of life as we have known it. Think about that, church. They say to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us? bringing us out of Egypt. And Moses is thinking, I thought I was setting you free. But the people, in their fear, and we have to be deeply compassionate about fearful people. In their fear, the people continue to berate Moses. They say, is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians, to do the thing we've always done, than to die in the wilderness. So be very clear. The people were afraid that they would die. And they would rather be enslaved than have life as they've always known it, life as they've always done it, come to an end. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Okay, maybe just me. We don't like endings, church. We will stay in harmful spaces because we think the end will kill us. And here's the thing, what kills us what wrecks us, us and our families and our churches every time is our failure to honor the past, to grieve out loud, and to mark the end. How many funerals and memorial services couldn't happen because of COVID? And how many families and communities were wrecked and remain emotionally wrecked because of an inability to mark the end. Like the Hebrew people at the Red Sea, we have to go through the end, we cannot go around it. And like the Hebrew people, God will part the waters. This Exodus story is pivotal to so many cultures and communities. It speaks of liberation, emancipation, freedom. Women see themselves in this text. The LGBTQ plus community locates themselves here. African descended people certainly take our images of God directly from this story. Palestinian siblings, indigenous folk, and other marginalized groups look to Exodus as a blueprint for God's liberating activity in the world. But it never struck me until now to pause in the Red Sea and look back. With an enormous wall of water to the left and another humongous wall of water to the right, 
with the promised land ahead of us and the wild cacophony of noises behind, what if we were to pause and look back? What do you see? What do you hear? And what are you experiencing? Oh, that's nice. The thunder and the rain. Thank you, God. I hear crying babies, screaming parents, the clatter of horse hooves on the shore, and the churning of those chariot wheels. All that adrenaline pumping, get mama in them. Folks probably lost things, dropped things. Maybe a shoe got stuck in the mud. Maybe, maybe we see an Egyptian face regarding us with hatred and disgust. Often when we think of this story, we imagine the people moving quickly forward, forward to the new beginning. But what if we paused and looked back? Take a deep breath, church. In our country, in our culture, I think it rarely strikes us to look back because we're supposed to be happy, right? Moving forward is good. Forward ever, backward never, onward and upward. And the great satchel page said, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. I mean, forward, there's no more slavery. Forward, there's a new beginning. Forward, there's a promised land, there's milk and honey. We're supposed to be happy. But forward is also unfamiliar and scary. And it's scary because change, no matter how much we want it, comes with grief. Grief of the end. You have a brand new shiny job. But you don't even know the people's names here yet. Your auntie died, and she's gone home to be with Jesus. But you loved her, and she's not here anymore. Reverend Adrian is here. We did it. We got us a pastor. But that means all those other pastors that we loved are not here, and they aren't coming back. And we've lost their humor, their sermons, their smiles, and their songs. And what do we do? We keep it moving, church. On to the next season before we've said goodbye to the last one, or the one before that, or the one before that. We move on before we've honored the past, grieved out loud, and marked the end. It would behoove us to pause and look back. Because life is changing, and we've all lost a lot of things. Church, you'll learn before long that I really believe in the power and wisdom of the body. So I'm going to ask you to do something else that is simple and not so simple. So whether you're here in the sanctuary or with us in the virtual space, I'm going to invite you to take a chance and stand up if you're able. And if you're unable, do what you can from your seat. 
So I'm gonna ask you to face the back, whatever the back is for you, face the back of your front. And this is symbolic of where you've come from. Now I know it probably feels silly, but humor me and give this moment to yourself and to the honoring of anything or anyone you have lost. I'm gonna invite you to call the names of your people, call to mind any events that need honoring. Speak your losses out loud or whisper them in your heart. And on behalf of our church, I wanna call the names of our former senior ministers as a way of honoring them as you are calling your own names. Because we grieve the loss of what has been and we wanna mark the end. So as you call your names, I add to them Reverend Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick, Reverend Dr. Robert James McCracken, Reverend Dr. Ernest T. Campbell, Reverend Dr. William Sloan Coffin, Jr. Reverend Dr. James A. Forbes, Jr. Reverend Dr. Brad R. Braxton. Rever Reverend Dr. Amy Butler. And church for whom and for what else shall we honor, grieve, and mark the end? When you feel you have sufficiently called your names and brought to your remembrance all the people and the events that you have lost, I invite you to turn back around and have your seats. In your own time, there's no rush. So we have to recognize that we may need to do this a few more times before we're ready to move on to our new beginning. When my big brother died about four years ago, I was on the phone a lot with my family, making plans, setting dates, comforting those who were in shock. And the most powerful thing that was said to me in the flurry of moving forward fast was said by my youngest sister, who I thank God is here in the sanctuary this morning. Her words forced me to pause and look back and remember that we had lost someone. Her words invited me to honor the past, grieve out loud, and mark the end. And she simply said, Adrian, I'm sorry for your loss. And I burst into tears. Riverside, to each of you individually and to us as a collective body, hear me say, I am sorry for your loss. Riverside has changed. These United States of America have changed. The children in our lives are growing up and growing older every day as they should, but they're changing. And I'm sorry for your loss. Bodies and minds don't do what they used to do. Some have loved ones in prison. Some have dreams we weren't able to realize. I am sorry for your loss. Many face racism, sexism, homophobism, classism, and other marginalizations. We've lost years of academic instruction God has vowed to bring us to a promised land, but right now we're still running through the water 
and we haven't even gotten to the wilderness. Take a deep breath, church. This is the end. And I'm sorry for your loss. God indeed has a promised land for us. But first, we must honor the past, grieve out loud, and mark the end. It took the Hebrew people 40 years, and we respect that grieving takes as long as it takes. We respect that tomorrow cannot come until today is over. And today, this morning, this moment, we've made a good start at marking the end. Like the Hebrew people, we are who we are because of what's behind us. We pause and we look back so that we can have a new beginning. May it be so. To God be the glory. Amen.